first met Chris Peldo in the early 1990s and his art was going to be featured in USA Today for the Absolute Illinois campaign. It was right before I started my gallery and so basically I started my gallery. Chris was in the first show, we had Wexler, Peldo, Swank and then a few months later the David Leonardis Gallery name went international in USA Today for the Absolute Illinois ad. I used that to sell a Screaming Head painting to Bristol Myers Squibb for $20,000 and the Michael Jordan garbage ball to Disney was $15,000. We have a lot of affordable original Chris Peldos and they would be an excellent addition to your collection. Hello and welcome back to Chit Chat with David Leonardis. Working with Mark Hauser is so cool because um, he makes me smile, so chit that's chit an energy chit chit, chit 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 If that's wrong, I don't want to be right. Uh, learning from Mark Hauser is easy and it's fun. And the guy is totally filled with all these fantastic stories. We like to talk about different artists and um, art dealers. Uh, out there is uh, Mark Kastabi, and Mark Kastabi was known for um, hiring people to do his paintings and I actually have a Mark Kastabi that um, he told me that he did draw so that's kind of a neat thing but uh, Mark go ahead and tell us a story about Mark Kastabi well first um, I first uh, heard about Mark Kastabi through Peter Miller okay. Peter Miller had these four Mark Kastabi drawings that were drawn by the Mark Kastabi they were just like black line drawings and I said, boy, how much are those? And so it, instead of buying it, we traded. So then uh, years later, I was uh, in uh, New York at Bloomingdale's. And uh, this guy comes up to me and says, hi, Mark Hauser? I said, yeah, he said, Mark Kostabi. He says, I've been watching you, you've been doing these ties and stuff. He says, boy, I said, well, Mark, I, I have a, a few of your pieces I bought from uh, uh, Peter Miller. He says, uh, he says, well, why don't you come back to, tomorrow? Why don't you come over to my studio and you can uh, see how we do things there? I said, hey, that sounds great. So I get there, and it used to be one of those little uh, porno booth play places. They had the little booths that you walk in the booth and you put a dollar in, and it opens up. And when you did that, you saw these guys painting Marcus Davi paintings. And you'd pay a dollar to watch them make paintings. Then, when you walked to the door, it was like a factory. It was like, there was like stacks and stacks of 8 inch by 10 inch Mark Kostabi paintings. And I said, boy Mark, I'd love to buy some of these. And it, it, when, I, when I was doing the big art purchasing deal, I didn't buy art like one or two pieces at a time. I bought a lot. So I walked into this place and there was all these 8 by 10 Mark Kostabis. And what he did was he made miniatures of all his famous paintings. And then he sold them, they, they sold in the gallery for about a thousand pieces. But if you bought them from Mark Kostabi, I think I paid maybe four or five hundred a piece, but I bought a lot of them. And I brought them back to my studio. And but then while I was there, Mark commissioned me to make ties for him. Right. And we made Mark Kostabi ties. And he ordered the first order was like four four different patterns, five hundred each. And uh it was kind of weird because uh, I still I have some over my place here. Because when you're making hand painted ties, one at a time, you have one, a lot of ones that don't work out. So I got a lot of the rejects that are product. They're kind of fun. I have like four or five hundred. I sold eighty thousand ties, Mark Collier ties. I sold eighty thousand Mark Collier ties in two years to uh, just to be because alone. Then uh, we sold some to this one place, the tie room in New York which is, was right near the Car Carnegie Theater. Um, that was just a fluke accent thing. I just was, uh, couldn't find a tie I liked. So a friend of mine told me, this guy, Joe Sherman, go over to see him. He's, he does hand-painted ties. I went there, I said, didn't see anything on the rack. He says, well, do you have any drawings? Give me some drawings. So I gave him a bunch of drawings I did. Came back a week later, he had like 25 ties done with my drawings on them. He says, Mark, we should manufacture these ties. I know we can sell a lot of them. Then that's the end of this. I sold 80,000. That is so fantastic. I actually have one of the Kastabi ties. Um, I remember um, going to Kastabi World. I remember that you used to have these small paintings that you're talking about. You had them kind of above your doorway there. Mm -hmm. 
um, all dead on. And I love just, you can see the commerce and the action interaction and learning from guys like Mark Hauser and Mark Kasabi. And well, I guess you up there, you get to learn from me because I'm bringing in these cool people. Good business, good business. All right, well, we've got some more fantastic commercials to get to. We'll see you in a minute. Paul Kostabi is an amazing New York-based artist. He was friends with the famous painter Jean-Michel Basquiat. He played on the first White Zombie album, and this art is going to be a fantastic addition to your art collection. Give me a call, and we'll see you on Polina Street. Christopher Makos is the most modern photographer in America, is a quote that Andy Warhol gave. I first met Christopher Makos in the 1990s, and I purchased immediately an altered image photograph of Andy Warhol in drag. Christopher told me that was the best purchase that I'd ever made uh, in my life, and that he um, continued to help me, and his big comment was, ratchet up a notch, darling. And so that's sort of the motto that um, we hold here at the David Leonardis Gallery uh, years later, that influence from Christopher Makos. He's flying around with Calvin Klein and the gang and doing shows internationally. And right here at the David Leonardis Gallery of Chicago, we are lucky to have original silver gelatin photographs of Christopher Makos. Give me a call, they look a lot better in your house. Welcome back to Chit Chat with David Leonardis, hanging out with Mark Hauser. He's been telling us stories the whole time, on camera and off camera. But Mark Hauser, uh, again, he's taken photographs of all these fantastically famous and super cool people. But I love my photograph that I have um, of Sophia Loren. What can you tell us about that experience? Sophia Loren, I got, we pulled up. Um, to her house in Florida. She owns an island that she has condominiums and uh, she rents it to people and she has a house there on the island. And um, her and Carlo, I haven't seen Carlo's dead though, but uh, this is when I did that, which was about, I'd say, the photo says she was at least, she was 60 then, she's like, she's gotta be, that had to be 15 years ago. I saw Sophia Loren in that movie Nine a couple of years ago, yeah. uh, where the guy's name was Guido, it was Daniel Day Lewis. Fantastic, fantastic movie. She had the most unbelievable body I've ever seen. I mean, her body looked like the body of a 24 year old. They saw her in almost next to nothing. She came walking out of the swimming pool one morning. But the day I got there, <laughs> um, I'm getting out of the car, and there's this really tall, with her high heels and stuff, she was over six feet tall, with that big wig, the big hair that she had, and she was walking away, and I swear to God, she looked like one of those drag queens that were imitating her. So I just wasn't sure if that was Sophia or, or just like her standard or something. So then she turned around and said, oh, you're Mark Hauser, oh, I just love your work, oh, that, that's so glad you could do this for me. Um, I have a whole bunch of things I need done. So the first day um, we, we got to this, she had this big, the Sophia Lauren Fountain. So I have, I'm setting up the sofa for the shot, and I have this chair sitting there, and uh, we're getting ready to do the shot, and this woman who's on the property, so people are walking through the photo session, and so she gets here. So she says, who are you photographing? Now Sophia was, I thought she was in the other room getting her makeup done, but she was standing right behind me, but I didn't see her. Uh-oh. And this woman came up to me and says, so who are you photographing? I said, my mother. He said, and then Sophia, she was pissed. What do you mean you're photographing your mother? Well, I said it was just kind of get the lady to get out. Get fired, she says. She did not have But then, then she, she uh, said she invited me back to come to their house at her house in Italy anytime. She said, because like in between each shot, I gave her a back rub. And she said, you get the best back rubs, Mark. Wow. She said, you can move in any time. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Hauser, and one, of, one, of, one of my other famous, great uh, Sophia Lauren story. At the end of the shoot, Carlo uh, grabbed, took a little silver, uh, one of those, what do they call those uh, case, those cases, what do they call it? Uh, Halberton cases, silver Halberton case, 
and I gave him the invoice. He opened up the Hubbard and cases, and his takes of ten thousand. He just handed me the money. One, you know, it was very nice. Cash is king, as they say. Wow, cash is king. Fantastic. Mark Hauser getting the stacks of cash. I actually have video of Mark Hauser buying art from me, and he paid me in hundred dollar bills. We'll have to look for that. We'll get back to that. We've got a couple more fantastic segments. We'll see you in a minute. Matt Lamb III was a third generation funeral home director. He worked very hard and he was, as I like to say, Batman rich. Well, the rich man fell sick and he was fearing his mortality, thought he might become one of his own customers. And so he pledged, as many of these um, patriarchal artists uh, who make thousands of pieces of art do, he pledged that he would make art full time if only the Lord would save him. Turns out he had mono. And so when you're Batman rich, you can make 40,000 pieces of art. Matt Lamb had studios in uh, Wisconsin, Chicago, Florida, Ireland. At one point, Matt Lamb flew me in a giant entourage to Dubai to rock with the billionaires and the international royalty. And I've done several interviews with some of those people, which are fantastic shoots. And I learned so much from Matt Lamb and also that I was in the right place at the right time. And I personally recently bought 235 Matt Lamb paintings from a collection. And I've done this a couple of times now. We have 400 Matt Lambs here at the David Leonardo's Gallery, which is 1% of the output of the artist. And I'm not even gonna tell you what they were charging for the paintings in Dubai to the absolute ruler and the international royalty gang, but let's just say you can afford the art now. So I'm here to help you collect Matt Lamb art and it's awesome. It's in all different sizes. People love it. You're going to love it. Give me a call and I will turn you into an art collector. Hello and welcome back to Chit Chat with David Lee Nardis, hanging out with Mark Hauser. So, Mark, <laughs> he's very musical. Um, one of my favorite photographs uh, that Mark Hauser has is this fantastic photograph of Cindy Crawford. She's 16 years old, she's in Hauser's studio, and what I like about the photo is that there's uh, Lee Gody uh, uh, paintings in the background, and then also some of Hauser's photography, and then um, some of the different artifacts in uh, Hauser's I mean, we're studio. Lee Gody. Well, yeah, we're talking about um, Cindy Crawford, but what about uh, Lee Gody? Lee Gody was, uh, she was kind of a bad lady. She was on Michigan Avenue, but she was very well known for doing these fantastic original pieces. And same kind of thing with Wesley Willis or, you know, even some of these other artists. I have a lot of pieces from Lee Gody. I sold a lot of them at the end of uh, Myron Shirt. Mm -hmm. Myron was one of my biggest, uh, you know, I had like a, my own little gallery in my studio that people would come by and, uh, Myron would, would come by with his driver once a week and buy something. He'd just say, Mark, what do you got that I can buy? I said, I got some Lee Goldies. He says, you want to sell that hat rack over there? That big bear hat rack? I said, sure, I don't want $5,000 for it. He said, pay the guy $5,000. So, you know, was, you know during, the, during the day, it was, a, it was different. Not to get $5,000 out of somebody's pocket. A little harder. But uh, Absolutely. Uh, Lee Cody, I used to see on Michigan Avenue at their institute, and she used to have her little auction going. Um, she used to take like nine pieces and put them on the steps, and then she would lift one at a time, and she'd say, what do I have? And there would be like nine or ten businessmen around. And she would, what do I get for this beautiful woman with a cigarette up her ass, or whatever it was. And I, and I said, ten dollars. And the guy said, twenty dollars. And you know, most of my, I think I got most of the stuff I bought for like $100, $125. Uh, then I bought one piece, I, uh, she was laying in the park um, over by uh, Grant Park, which is now Millennium Park, I think, where she was laying. And she was laying there and sleeping on a piece, and it was a triple nude. 
which is now owned by, um, well, gosh, that uh, doctor. Oh, he, I sold Zip. But she was laying on this triple nude, and I had to, uh, and I said, hey, Lee, how you doing? What do you want for that piece? She said, oh, this is one of my best, Mark. I don't do a lot of nudes. I, I want at least $200 for it. So I'll give you 150 Then I'll work. I want $200 for it. And, and can you go over and get me a couple of uh, McDonald's hamburgers? And I need a bra. <laughs> can you go over to Walgreens and get me a bra? I said, well, how big a bra do you wear? She says, well, I said, no, it looks like Don't tell me she flashed it. No, no. Okay. But that she, she flashed a lot of people. Oh, really? But the problem is, some of the pieces I got, she was, you know, she had a bad, uh, she had a bad problem. You know, she would get kicked out of a lot of hotels because she was not uh, potty trained. You know, so, so uh, like a lot of pieces, I would have to take uh, Listerine and clean them. But, you know, she had this whole technique that she would put a wax surface. A lot of them had a... What well, made it go to you now, you can tell if it's real or not, is she would take wax and melt it and put it on a, on a piece on top of it for a ceiling. So, she was great though. She was a one of a kind. And uh, I'm telling you, I bought those pieces and I averaged uh, those. I, I think I bought them for about 100, 125. I just sold one a few months ago for five grand. And some of them are, and uh, I know some of them have gone, the, the triple new they bought. I sold it to Norbert Gleischer, the, the doctor, Dr. Norbert Gleischer. I got $10,000 for that piece. And that was, a, that was a good deal. I wish I still had that piece. I wish I still had a lot of the pieces. That piece I wish I really had. It was very, how often did she do nudes? Maybe two or three. This was a, a triple one. Three women in a row. You used to have that uh, on the second floor of your building on Cortland, yeah. uh, in the, your bedroom, in the big room, and there were goatees everywhere. And I remember the nudes. The big triple nude that I remember there was a hallway going into my studio and those were all covered with Lee Goatees. People would walk in all the time. My makeup artist, she had like five or six of them that they'd sell them to her for like a thousand a piece. Now those are worth like five grand a piece. Wow. Well I used to have two hundred Howard Finsters. I used to um, work as a waiter. I would eat on the job and spend all of my money on Howard Finsters. All of a sudden I was an art dealer. 20 years later, the rest is history. We've got a lot more history. We've got just one or two more segments with Mark Hauser eating I'll on. I'll have a double cheese pizza with sausage, mayo, and mustard to go, David. Speaking of mustard, Mark Hauser has some cool mustard, but we'll talk about that in a minute. We'll see you in a minute. The Reverend Howard Finster is the grandfather of contemporary American folk art. He's a visionary artist. He was painting a bicycle as he was a, a retired reverend and also a bicycle repairman. He's painting this bicycle and the paint forms a face on his hand and tells him to paint sacred art. He tells the face, I can't do that, only professionals can do that. The voice says to him in an ever increasing tone, how do you know, how do you know, how do you know? So he pulls out George Washington from his pocket because he didn't have Ben Franklin, although later on he had plenty of Ben Franklins. And then he said, maybe I can do this. The man made just shy of 47,000 pieces of art shown throughout the world. He was a dear personal friend and mentor to me. We published 36 signed limited edition silkscreen prints of his works and feature his originals as well here at the David Leonardis Gallery in Chicago. The Reverend Howard Finster's art has this super powered spiritual aspect that is a winner for anyone who possesses it. Give me a call and they look a lot better in your house. Hi, I'm Jerry Szymanski, attorney at law. I get the job done. When you need an attorney you can get the job done for you in the areas of personal injury, criminal law, DUI, in commercial transactions, you want to call me, the Bulldog, because I get the job done, and I'll get the job done for you. Call me today. All right, well, I mean, um, again, Mark Hauser is the original merchandiser. He used to do hams, uh, mustards, just so happens that I have a mustard here. Sweet, hot, stone ground mustard. Mark Hauser's mustard. It's How cool is that? It's the biggest seller. That, that type, uh, champ or champagne honey. 
We well, have eight different ones now. I used to only have like four, now I got eight different flavors. Some crazy friend of mine who owns a mustard factory in Wisconsin called me up on the phone and said, Mark, want to make a, a little bit of money? I said, sure, I, I'm always into making a little bit of money. He says, well, I got this idea. Why don't you have Mark Hauser mustard? He said, I love mustard. I said, I use mustard on everything. He says, well, why don't we come out with a series of mustard and I'll put them in my place and you can get them in some other places. So I put them in my place. I got New York City Bagel uh, Deli. Uh, they sell my mustard. They sell about two cases a week. Um, and uh, a little bit here, a little bit there. I'm, I'm trying to hopefully get it into Treasure Island. You know, that's what my mother used to be. She used to be a mark. My mother was a market genius. She, she, in, she, she found Orville Reitenbecker. She discovered over at Becker. She was driving her car on a country road, and there was this guy selling bowl jar bottles of popcorn, and it said, it had a big sign that said, Gourmet Popping Corn, Orville Reitenbecker. And she says, We're going to make millions together, Orville. And she brought, brought it downtown. My mother had 300 women that would demonstrate in grocery stores, and she uh, made Orville Reitenbecker millions. She should have too bad she didn't make herself, but she did okay. My mom's okay. She's 82 years old now. It was just her birthday, and uh, she's doing okay. I, 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 but that, uh, you see, my what what I had going for me is I had two sides of parents. My father's side was the business side. My Most mother's people, side was yeah. the my mother's side was the creative side. But and now, then nobody had parents like my parents were like unbelievable. They did everything for me. My parents, but, but at the age of five years old, they were trying to figure out. So what could we have Mark do for a living? He's such a crazy kid. What are we going to have him do? So they were trying everything. And they even sent me to the school. Northwestern had a school that you would take tests to see what you should be doing. And they said, uh, they came out of the test and they said, Well, uh, we've got done all the tests on Mark and uh, we've decided that he's going to be able to do a couple things. Either he's going to be a gas station attendant or he's going to work at Kentucky Fried Chicken, southern down making some chicken, sitting down the pots, or he's, he's got a really great imagination, he's got crazy ideas, maybe he'll do something creative. So my parents, uh, my father gave me a camera, a little Brian Hawkeye, and I started taking pictures with it, and I really liked doing it, and that's how it all started. And then I, I won the contest at camp in Colorado, and uh, I said, hey, you know what? And then, then people start buying my photographs, like for ten dollars. Ten dollars, boy, oh boy! And, and all I have to do is snap a bunch of pictures. So I decided, hey, this might be a good living. So I start to start taking pictures, and people would come up to me and have to me take the picture for the yearbook. And I worked for when I was a kid. I worked for Stan Malinowski. Pretty good. And then I photographed people like Cindy Crawford, which was a kind of a very different. You know, she was, that was from a whole different land. But I uh, have this mustard, it's very good, very good. Go out and buy it at New York City Bagel, you can buy it tomorrow. Or David Lynn Artist is probably going to be selling it soon. That's right, tune in to chitchatshow.com or dlg-gallery.com and I'll be sure to have a uh, link so you can click right on there and buy some mustard. How much would this mustard go for uh, in a you know single, single Five jar? Dollars. Five bucks for Mark Hauser mustard. I love mustard. Not so much with the ketchup. I'm always a mustard guy. And um, I just wanted to say that uh, my mom is an artist and my father is a businessman. And so I sort of wound up the art businessman. But they weren't really in that business. They didn't really kind of mold me along quite the way Hauser did. Um, sometimes it's nepotism. Sometimes you're uh, learning from your peers. Uh, I heard Hauser mentioned Stan Malinowski, he used to have the Exeter magazine and he was a real big photographer but you need to learn from other people and um, if the other people are cool then all the better and uh, being creative and being involved in the arts and um, giving forth in life is really a lot about what my TV show is about, what my art career is about and obviously that's what Mark Hauser is about. I have had so much fun doing this Cool Old Dudes series. We've got a few more Cool Old Dudes that we're going to be talking about. You're just going to need to stay tuned to Chit Chat with David Leonardo. I'm going that Jimi Hendrix is coming back from the dead to be on the show. <laughs> or maybe Jim Morrison. Rumor has it. 
Rumor has it, I'm sure it's true, you can't believe uh, none of what you hear and half of what you read or something like that, that came from Lou Reed. I'm sure Mark Hauser's got a Lou Reed story, but I'm going to have to hear that off camera. We'll see you next time. Next time on Paranormal Museum. Hello, my name is Tommy Wilson, uh, Howard Fenster's grandson. I'm here at the Howard Fenster Vision House. I guess I'm here to tell my ghost story. In the other room, it was a dead lady laying on the ground, and she had black hair. And uh, I turned and looked, and I seen the outline of a woman. And I turned back and looked to my wife, and I said, uh, who is that woman out there? And she turned and looked and said, what woman? I was looking down the garden at this little building Papa made in 1979. And I was standing there all of a sudden, uh, I, don't, I don't know what happened, it's just like something invisible jumped into the top of that building. It looked like it leaped or, you know, from the ground into the building. And I turned back and it was gone and I immediately went out the door and there was no one out there. And I don't think no one's that fast. Yeah, and I was like, I was like whoa, was that real? And uh, I, I think it was real. Complete with a chap when human remains buried on the property, the Howard Fenster Vision House Museum in Somerville, Georgia, sounds like a set of a Hollywood horror movie. Howard Fenster, a prolific and nationally recognized artist, created over 40,000 pieces of religious folk art in the basement of his home. After his death in 2001, his home was converted into a museum by Chicago-based art gallery owner David Leonardis. Apparently, David got a little more than expected when he purchased the home, as occurrences of unexplained phenomena intrigue guests and stir operations at the museum on a daily basis. David, along with several independent teams of paranormal investigators, are on a mission to prove or debunk the existence of ghosts at the museum. Is the Howard Finster Vision House Museum haunted? Tune in and watch the investigations, and you be the judge. Is Howard Finster here? Is there any spirits here that would like to talk to us? We're in the Howard Finster House. Is there any spirits or ghosts here? Let me know that. Come on, Mr. Finster, talk to me. Let me know your garden is. What is she doing here? What? I know what I saw. I'm not stupid. <laughs> oh, even though people see this might think I am, so. Are you the ghost that is in the Howard Finster Vision House? <laughs>